Good evening, ma'am. You're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, yes. Good evening to each one of you. That's great. Thank you. All well. All well. And shall we start? So, dot time. Yeah. Kunjan, do you want to go? Yeah, I, we can start. We have participants as well. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at this uh, late hour in India as well as in other parts of uh, the eastern side of the hemisphere. Um, my name is Gunjan Jain. I work with Climate Trends and uh, this is uh, our uh, discussion that we have planned around the carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism, which of course is impacting uh, trade and uh, global climate negotiations in every way. Um, we have a stellar panel here with us and uh, I think without further ado, I'll kind of hand over to Archana who can introduce everyone and kickstart on this discussion. Uh, very excited to hear what each one of you has to say and how we can look at this uh, issue as more and more G7 countries are coming up with their CBAM policies and what implications this will have. Uh, Archana, over to you. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, Hello, everyone. My name is Archana Chaudhary and I am, uh, I, I am uh, with the Climate Trends team, I uh, am the Associate Director here. Uh, we couldn't have our Director Aarti here today. She's a little unwell. So she's away, but uh, she's ho we're hoping she'll join in a little bit. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you all for making the time to come here today and uh, be with us, uh, join us in this discussion. We are going to be speaking about uh, the implications and impacts of one of the most bold policy actions uh, global policy actions taken by the EU, which has implications for businesses across the globe, especially in developing economies. And uh, this, as we all know, that the EU carbon border adjustment mechanism, it has been criticized as a unilateral trade measure by some countries. And we know that many global South nations, including India, China, South Africa, uh, have, among the other countries, have made their positions clear on this. But uh, this CBAM is an interesting uh, policy nonetheless, uh, because it places a carbon price on imports of carbon intensive products. At the moment, it's steel, cement, aluminum, fertilizers, and is part, as we know, of EU's Fit for 55 plan, which were, was put in place uh, to reduce their carbon uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030. But for countries that export uh, carbon intensive products to the EU, this will mean uh, higher costs, disruption in supply chains and reduced competitiveness. Having said that, uh, if more and more countries, as we hear from others, uh, other countries also look at similar mechanisms, it is time that we all sat together, try to understand what the implications of this is for our respective countries and for the global economy. And uh, to uh, see what the way forward will be in terms of solutions, in terms of how countries that are emerging can be handheld. This is the reason why we're here and we have a fabulous panel with us. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Aruna Sharma. She is the former secretary at the Ministry of Steel, Government of India. She is a seasoned development economist and has had a distinguished career as an Indian bureaucrat. Uh, she's had several pivotal roles. She was Secretary Steel, as I just mentioned, uh, in which she has formulated policy um, and implemented policy for uh, increasing production efficiency and sustainability in the Indian steel industry. She uh, has also, uh, she was also the Secretary, India Secretary for in the Ministry of Electronics and IT. Uh, apart from her role in the steel industry, she has been instrumental in several government uh, reforms for India. Uh, she has spear she spearheaded a program called Samagra, uh, which was a governance software which is being used by multiple states across India. And uh, she put in, she was instrumental in also creating the government e marketplace. Uh, we she is she's a member of uh, the Reserve Bank of India's high level committee on uh, deepening digital payments. And she has authored uh, num numerous reports and papers. We're very happy that she could make the time. Welcome, Dr. Sharma. Thank you. So would you, would you like me to address? No, ma'am, if you could just. Yeah, that's right. 
Yeah, I'll come to you uh, immediately after this. Uh, we also have with us Amitendu, Amitendu Palit, uh, Senior Research Fellow and Research Lead of uh, Trade and Economics at the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. Uh, Dr. Palit is a senior, uh, has is an economist who is well known. Uh, he specializes in international trade and investment policies. Uh, before a stint at I uh, at the ISAS, Dr. Palit has served for nearly a decade in the Ministry of Finance, Government of India, uh, and he was responsible for handling. Uh, key macroeconomic policy areas, uh, balance of payments, foreign exchange reserves. So he has a vast experience in the system, in understanding governance systems, as well as uh, studying it as an economist. Uh, uh, we are very, very happy that you could make the time, Dr. Palin. Thank you, Achim. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Claudia, Claudia Azevedo. She's a policy analyst uh, based uh, at the Europe Shark the Force Institute. Uh, she is, uh, she's been with them uh, and has been focusing on the intersection of trade, environment and development and uh, has helped shape EU's green trade policies, uh, including the CBAM, because she has worked closely with uh, uh, Pascal Lamy, Director General of, uh, of the WTO, former. Um, she has also worked with uh, Director General Think of her think tank, uh, Genevieve Pons, and uh, she has been working and uh, specializing on uh, policy briefs that highlight the challenges and opportunities in aligning trade and environment policy. Welcome, Claudia. Thank you very much. And finally, Sutame Magmale. He is an economist uh, who has been working uh, at sustainable growth in trade and industry policy strategies, uh, which is a South African uh, economic research organization. He has focused on uh, global climate trade policies and in designing climate compatible value chains for carbon intensive industries, which we're going to discuss today. Uh, for South Africa, as well as Africa, he works extensively on, uh, he, uh, on just transition in South Africa. And we're extremely glad that he could make the time uh, to join us today. Welcome. Thank you very Along much. Thank you, Sitame. And finally, we have Anindita Gupta, uh, who is a fellow at India's National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. Um, she is uh, she has been providing research support um, uh, for policy development at the uh, for the De Department of Economic Affairs in the Indian Ministry of Finance, and her she has been studying climate resilient mechanisms, climate finance, and public policy. Um, she has done broader research on uh, India's engagement with multilateral development banks on issues like climate finance, as well as mobilizing private capital. Uh, she has contributed to research in areas like climate finance, external debt management, carbon pricing systems. And uh, recently her paper on the CBAM uh, was very well received. So we're very happy to have her here. Welcome. Thank you so much. So now that we've uh, introduced our speakers, we'd like to uh, go in headlong into the discussions. Uh, may I come to you, uh, Aruna ma'am, first? We'll, uh, we'll go, uh, I'll call upon each of the speakers to speak for about five minutes on CBAM to begin with, and maybe explain your perspective on uh, this policy measure and how you see the implications on uh, India's as well as global uh, supply chains. So I'll start with uh, you, ma'am, and then I can. I would like to go over Sitami to you next, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Archana. Uh, you know, I'll I'll just take five minutes to make you understand that what should be our focus areas uh, when we are having discussions on the impact on the developing economies or underdeveloped economies of. So if you look at the root cause, you know, we, it started off with the call on the agreed principles. The word agreed principles is very important because that highlights the agreed concern across the group for all member countries. But equally important is that what should be the carbon emission accepted, it has to be an acceptable norm of emissions and pace. These two are very important. So each country has to decide what is their acceptable norms of emissions 
because there cannot be a, a blanket definition for that, for the different sectors of the industry and how we are going about it and the pace at which they will be achieving it because it will require directions, flow of funds, uh, handholding and mechanisms to measure it. So with all these, these are the two things which were sort of short-circuited the moment the CBAM, that is the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, was announced by the European Union. And if you look at it, that across the globe, the ESG thing came up in the corporate world, where E is the environment. So in the sense that consciousness has come everywhere, that each, everybody has to do an analysis of the carbon emission they are going ahead and doing it. Now, if you look at it, uh, why did the EU go for it? Because for the local production, they had something called ETS, that is the emissions trading system. In the sense, they started taxing the producers within the EU, where they thought that the greenhouse emissions are not from the norms, acceptable norm of the EU. And therefore, they said it has to be taxed. Now, to sort of offset it with the uh, imports they will be taking from the other countries, they came up with CBAP. So in the sense, the imported goods were subjected to the similar carbon cost so that they are uh, sort of at the same pace. They have equity of treatment uh, in the production cost. So that is the genesis how this whole thing came up. Now, if you look at it, now all the exporters to the EU, they will have to report their emission data. Now, how do you have a mechanism to measure this emission data? Because CPAM is only looking at the carbon dioxide emissions. It is not the environment impact at all. Neither it is looking at, at it in the entire holistic manner. So the suppliers will have to focus only on the carbon dioxide emission data, not the other parts. And that is what they will have to report it to EU whenever they plan to export to that particular uh, uh, EU countries. Now, for this, they will have to invest on the impact assessment. Then you will have the uh, you will have to engage highly trained professional teams, which will be calculating not just the emissions in the air, but also what is most important is the embedded emissions. Now, embedded emissions is something which is a highly skillful job. And that will be an add-on cost to each of these producers, which are in the listed designated goods today. What Archana rightly said, iron and steel, aluminium, cement, fertilizer, electricity, and hydrogen at this phase. But nothing stops it to be extended to others. So what will happen in case they want to be in the export chain to the EU countries? And now support from the other G7 countries like Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and US. Then what is going to happen? they will have to change their priority of investments. They will have to have their investments in having a mechanism to have these professional teams to measure the emission data and be arranged with it, both embedded and what is released in the atmosphere. They will have to do the necessary investments for it. So the entire priority chain of the investments of these producers is going to change. Now, when we are talking about this kind of a thing, the CPAM is very, very laudable, no doubt about it. It accelerates and mitigates the carbon leakages emissions and all those countries which are interested in the exports to these G7 countries, it is putting them into an accelerated mode to put their priorities and investments here. But then when you look at it, that this trading system and border adjusted mechanism, that is your CBAM and your internal uh, manufacturers of these countries, they will earn the money from the CBAM will be in invested into their internal uh, tax emission trading systems. So they will be getting a support from the government, whereas the exporting countries will have to invest from their own mechanics. Now, this is something of way ahead of the WT, which is very, very good. And it is something uh, we all are signatories to the SDGs. This is but here, I would just like to list uh, four concerns before I uh, close my uh, initial remarks. That if you look at it, you know, uh, the resources are limited in developing and underdeveloped. So the exports will have to be invested by the industry itself when you're going ahead with it. 
And this is going to have a major impact in the African countries. We have a uh, co-panelist, and I'm very sure he will be expanding on that and their levels of uh, concerns and preparation. And it will definitely, like I said before, at the cost of other priorities for growth. Then, when you again look at it, it was supposed to be in COP countries on global welfare cost, right? Because it will have an impact on the GDP growth, what is happening there. Now, again, by putting CBAM by EU or the G7 countries, it is a complete violation of the equality principles. So in the sense, the money so collected or the assistance or handholding is definitely will be focused on the countries who are ahead or who can afford to immediately invest. And they have defined what should be the pace and what should be the uh, acceptable norms. So they have taken the lead on that and they are going to go ahead with this. The second thing is CBAN is a complete violation of what you call CBDR. That is common but differentiated responsibility, which is being agreed in the Paris Principle and UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, the other panelists who are experts on the climate change, they will appreciate this, that here there is no differentiated responsibility. The CBAM is just like a whip that, okay, if you want to export to you, this is what you have to be, and that is what how you have to go. And if you look at India, if I tell you the example of India, it is the cost is going to be 7 to 15% at polar duties. So this is what it is going to be. And today, like I said before, it is only on carbon dioxide emission. Tomorrow, it also comes on the power generated in the value chain emissions then you can imagine what the cost will be. Because in the same products, if you if you go at the every stage of value chain, then it is going to be extremely, extremely matter of concern. And that is where this embedded uh, carbon comes into picture. Then if you look at it, that the earnings are completely consumed within EU. So what CBAM tax, your cross-border tax you are putting it, that earnings will be completely consumed within EU and not going as a differentiated responsibility. It is not going into a global welfare cost, not at all. So this is a matter of concern uh, for all the developed and developing economies when we are going ahead with it. So what is needed is a little bit of preparation time, the country to decide their norms. Then if they want to be an export, yes, you have to accept the norms set by the importing country and stagger their investments accordingly or accelerate their investments depending on their dependency on the export to the European Union. So it has to be synchronized completely with the environment concerns, yes, but also their manufacturing goals as we are moving ahead. So India is going ahead in defining what you mean by a green steel or a green power generations or green aluminum or cement and everything. But yes, it has to be at the pace which will be acceptable to the industry and we move ahead. So I think I'll stop here with my opening remarks and then we can move ahead. Thank you. Thank you. That was very succinct and extremely uh, well put. Uh, if I can, uh, we'll, we'll park that aside, the, the, the main concerns that you have raised. We'll come back to that because they're very interesting points. If I can then go to Sitami and uh, see what the, the perspective on CBAM is like from uh, from Africa, from how how is it looking like for the African countries and what is going to be the impact? If you could spend five minutes on explaining. Oh, thanks, thanks, uh, Achna. So, excuse me. So from an African perspective, so there's a um, few key issues that have actually came up um, with the introduction of the EU CBAM, um, which we all know that it came about uh, um, around 2019 when the European Green Deal was introduced. Um, so, but from, from that time, what we see is that even to this, you know, to this day, there has been a lack of awareness in the African continent about the EU mechanism, right? Um, the CBAM, as, as, as it stands, and some other developing BCAs, for example, we start seeing the US, you know, um, debating several policies that they, you know, they might emulate, um, you know, the 
the objectives of the, the EU CBAM. And we've seen recently with the UK CBAM being in consultations. Um, but overall, when we start seeing the introduction of this uh, border carbon adjustments in African continent, um, you know, there has been um, generally a lack of awareness if, you know, what these mechanisms actually entail. I mean, we've been trying to, you know, engage with uh, different um, key stakeholders, especially in the South African case, we've been trying to, um, you know, engage with the, you know, impacted sectors or value chains rather um, in the iron, steel and aluminium sectors and you know, um, I think at the moment I can positively say that uh, most of the firms in the aluminium and iron and steel, which are highly impacted, are actually aware of the, the mechanism. But generally, broadly in the African context, we, you know, looking at the vulnerabilities, we see North Africa, um, you know, Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, um, Tunisia, in the southern Africa, we see Mozambique and South Africa, you know, coming out strong, of course, broadly looking at the African continent, you know, as much as they're not necessarily impacted by CBAM, they are actually, you know, impacted by other measures that are part of the European Green Deal. So we see this, for example, through the deforestation free supply chain. So we start to see this, um, you know, broadly going into East Africa because it's highly dependent on agricultural exports that goes into the EU. But generally the first issue is that there is lack of awareness um, of some of these measures and we try by all means to share as much information as possible that we, we gather and try to make, you know, a lot of people away in the, in the continent. But other than that, there are some other issues that, um, you know, the continent is facing. So one of the, the, the key issues that the, the continent is facing is the industrialization. As much as, for example, we've seen, um, you know, at the moment, other continents have been able to, to industrialize, the African continent is battling with industrialization. So as much as we've seen on the CBAM, you know, some of the key sectors that are highlighted there, we look at the iron and steel aluminum. So those are some of the sectors that have been actually driving industrialization in the continent. And at the moment, we start seeing a decline in activity in those sectors, which is a, um, a huge concern. Then the other issue is that, um, I mean, I think there was, you know, if not yesterday or the day before that, there was, um, an article at the Financial Times where the Director General of the WTO um, you know, was interviewed there and it was highlighted that uh, actually they're looking into mechanisms, especially in terms of uh, an international carbon pricing system, right? Which might be a solution for, you know, to protect, for example, vulnerable economies, mostly in Africa, because we, you know, most of the African continents don't have carbon pricing in place. So there's only South Africa that has carbon pricing. So they have carbon tax introduced in 2019. So it's the only country in the continent that has been able to move forward in that space. So as much as they have the carbon price in place, so the carbon tax is quite low uh, by global standards. And that's going to be a huge issue as we, you know, we start, you know, the, the, the CBAM start, you know, its implementation from 2026. So in a sense, there is low, um, you know, level of protection in terms of carbon pricing in the continent. So while we see this um, increase of this, you know, um, carbon border adjustments being introduced or, you know, still in debate, but we, you know, we, we're going to be heavily impacted by them in the African continent because we don't have, um, you know, carbon, you know, pricing or carbon taxes in place to protect us, as we know, as part of the EU CBEM and recently with the UK CBEM, they are allowing um, you know, certain concessions, if, for example, jurisdiction have a carbon tax in place. So that's a good thing. Um, I'm, I'm not going to highlight the other issues, but one last issue that I want to highlight, you know, in, in, you know, considering the time that I'm given here is that, uh, um, you know, South Africa specifically, there's an issue of, uh, you know, carbon intensity. So there's a data, if you are familiar with the data, so we've done some studies and we've actually saw that South Africa is one of the most carbon intensive economy in the world, right? Which will become a huge problem, especially when we start exporting our, you know, iron and steel uh, products into the EU. So that will basically translate to, you know, higher, you know, um, you know, cost to, to, to the products that we send into the EU. And the reason 
of the, the high carbon intensities because the South African economy still, you know, depends highly on, on coal. So around 80% of the South African electricity is produced from coal, which is a huge concern. But um, I think to just, you know, round it off, I think, um, you know, Dr. Sharma was, you know, highlighted that there were two issues, especially with regards to the introduction of, of these PCAs. And one of the, the issues is that we, we need more time um, you know, and we also like resources. So there is a need for for us, um, especially coming from the global south to, you know, for example, if there's, you know, some space for engagement with the EU or the G7s to, you know, um, get more time, um, you know, um, in terms of transitioning, you know, away from the, the, the fossil fuel based, you know, or, you know, or carbon intensive economies. So more time, I think the global south is what, you know, what they need. You know that will allow the global south to prepare themselves and to also, you know, remain competitive or be competitive in the, you know, international trade space. So I'll just leave it there, and um, yeah, I'm happy to engage more. Thank you so much. So uh, lack of information, the fact that it's going to hit industrialization processes across African countries, and the fact that. Uh, maybe countries, partner countries should have been given more time to prepare before something so uh, big was put in place. Those are very interesting points and we'll come back to them. Uh, if I can bring in Amitendu now, because now you've heard uh, perspectives from India and from uh, from um, from Africa. Uh, Amitendu, if you'd like, please take five minutes and share what how you're seeing uh, global supply chains being impacted by what is by by the CBAM's full impact once it starts in 2026. Thank you, Achana. Let me uh, add to what uh, we have already discussed over here uh, from the uh, perspective of supply chains. Uh, look, I think it's important to note the fact that uh, CBAM is a regulation which should not be looked at in isolation. And if we look at the European Union, which has brought in this regulation, it needs to be looked at the context of a similar regulation, like say, for example, the deforestation regulations. And also the fact that when we look at CBAM, the initial impression is that there are end use industries, like for example, steel, aluminum, fertilizers, cement, so on and so forth, which would uh, probably be facing relatively more difficulties in so far as their exports into the European Union is concerned. But the moment one considers the impact of CBAM in its entirety and it steps into the domain of indirect impacts. So let's say, for example, the kind of fuel that has gone on to the production of these elements and also the fact that in future, this might even extend to services. And if you bring into consideration services like their shipping and aviation, then clearly the extended impact of uh, the regulation like CBAM on uh, supply chains is fairly extensive. Now, I will not go into the specific details of this, but I think it's important to note one specific point that there is a possibility that a quick implementation of CBAM, and as of now, we are expecting that CBAM will be implemented by the date by which it has been put in practice can lead to at least uh, one short to medium term impact in supply chains. And that could be uh, a kind of a differentiated shaping of supply chains in terms of the standards that CBAM requires to be brought into place and another in terms of the standards that CBAM or related border carbon adjustment measures do not require to be brought into place. So what I basically mean is that from the point of view of an exporter, engaged in a supply chain required to comply with CBAM regulations, that could be one kettle of fish. Vis-a-vis -vis another set of standards for another set of countries and export destinations, which do not require the CBAM compliance. Uh, this is a likely possibility. This is a very likely possibility, but there is a challenge here. And the challenge comes in terms of the fact that not all enterprises will have the capacity to differentiate their production in terms of two end standards. Now, in that case, a lot comes on to certain states and countries in terms of the way they look at aligning their regulations. I don't think any state in the medium term will be comfortable in actually harboring and encouraging presence of two different sets of regulations. 
it doesn't work that way. There's an enormous amount of policy confusion and inconsistency that would come into place. Now, this is where states need to lick a position. One position is that, look, if one agrees with the EU's principle and intent of imposing border carbon adjustments, and also supports the fact that there are other G7 countries, the UK has already uh, brought in place a CBAM, there's a strong possibility that Canada and Japan might do so in the uh, sort of foreseeable future. It's entered into the discussion discourse in the United States. So if there is a view in terms of recipient countries uh, where prospects are going to get affected by CBAM, let's say, for example, it could be India, it could be Indonesia, it could be Malaysia, it could even be, you know, Korea for that matter. If there is a view in these countries that ultimately the greater objective towards fighting carbon and maintaining international competitiveness of their production is simultaneously served by creating domestic regulations that align closely to the CBAM and other border carbon adjustments, then they would clearly anticipate the outcome and try not to create two different sets of standards and differentiate the supply chains. But it might not happen that way as well. Certain countries might not think that way. And they might actually feel that there are far more incentives and far better, you know, uh, I would say compliance ease if two sets of standards are followed with enterprises being given the option to choose between what they are. I mean, we have seen that happening in many other areas. For example, food standards. We have seen that countries have local food standards and international food standards between the HACCP and other standards. This happens. So I have a feeling that the first five years from the actual implementation of CBAN will be a very important period to watch out for. There are concerns in many parts of the world, including in developing Asia particularly, insofar as how this is going to play out. But I suspect that what is likely to happen is that uh, for a certain period of time, uh, there will be this effort to engage. There will be that effort to bilaterally talk out matters with CBAM, like imposing nations and states and other bigger partners. But unfortunately, the multilateral rules-based framework at this point in time is not in a position to provide the solution to this. So what might happen going further from there, one step ahead, and this is uh, where I stop for the time being, is that there's a strong possibility that environment regulations and bringing in within the scope uh, border adjustment taxes and border carbon adjustment measures might be brought within the purview of the larger free trade agreements that we have seen existing between countries. We have already seen an effort being made uh, in that direction towards certain uh, free trade agreements. For example, the one that Singapore has with Australia, uh, the one that maybe the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is looking at, while it is not an FTA, but it's a collaborative of countries. It might even happen elsewhere as well. So there are two in that case outcomes that I would basically like to point out. The first is the differentiation of standards in terms of the CBAM, non-CBAM compliance which will be totally dependent upon enterprise abilities, mostly in the global south, to stick to these and see how countries accept that reality. The other is a greater space of this conversation within the existing free trade agreements, which actually to me might be a better way forward. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, and we would really hear, like to hear a little bit more on uh, this differentiated po uh, policy measures or uh, having two different systems for um, for these products. How that will work if it is if CBAM is then extended to a, a wider range. We'll come back to you on, on that question. But if I may now go uh, to Claudia, and because now you've heard a variety of uh, opinions on, on and perspectives on how CBAM will impact the world. Uh, how is the EU looking at this? And I'm sh and these objections are have been raised. So if you can take five minutes and explain to us what the views are from there. Yeah, of course. Uh, so let me just take one minute to introduce myself. So my name is Claudia. I work at a Brussels-based think tank called Europe Jack the Love focusing on sustainability issues. And uh, for the past uh, two years, I've been uh, following closely the adoption of all of these trade-related climate measures by the EU, which 
as the has been said before by the previous panelists, includes CBAM but includes deforestation regulation. And in particular, in particular, we've been focusing on the impact of these measures on developing countries, providing policy recommendations to the EU on how to best engage and support partner countries complying with these measures. And of course, CBAM is one of many, but is a, a key measure. Uh, and from the point of view of the EU, it's a climate tool. It's uh, something that is intended to mirror uh, the EU ETS, so the EU Emissions uh, Trading uh, System, and to avoid the risk of um, carbon leakage. Now, uh, the, the, the reality is the CBAM should not be looking to uh, in, in isolation, right? Because as a climate tool, it aims to tackle the climate crisis which uh, was stems from decades of industrialization for which developing country, developed countries are primarily responsible for. So this is where all of these concerns around climate justice, climate fairness, uh, com compatibility with the common, common but differentiated, uh, differentiated principle uh, comes into play. So this is one set of, the, of concerns that the EU has been trying to, to address and that we hear very uh, loudly from mainly developing countries. And then the other set of concerns has to do with the impacts on trade that has also been uh, covered. But the reality is uh, the CBAM is the first ever border carbon adjustment, like large scale spanning several sectors. And therefore, it will most likely be the testing ground uh, for future BCAs in, in other countries, which pose a variety of challenges. Some of these concerns were discussed while CBAM was negotiated uh, uh, within the, the European institutions. For instance, the European uh, Parliament tried to include uh, an exemption for LDCs. So, which didn't make it uh, through in the final text at the end of the day. Same when it comes to the CBAM revenues. So there was discussions during the negotiation process whether to repurpose the CBAM revenues and provide it uh, to uh, developing countries to help them comply uh, with the tool. Uh, at the end of the day, it also didn't make it to the text. So as of now, the only thing that the CBAM regulation says is, uh, is re there is a reference in the preamble where the, the EU re uh, restates its commitment to supporting partner countries. But the truth of the matter is, this is not a binding commitment. It's a statement. It's a valuable statement by the EU, but it's still to be seen how these will uh, be implemented uh, in practice. So no, now, where do we stand? Um, we stand at, uh, at a time where the transitional period is ongoing. So since, 2000 and, uh, since uh, October 2023 until the end of 2025, there is a transitional period where there are uh, several uh, flexibilities in place to which exporters can, can use, um, for instance, default values, different um, methods of emission calculation, which they will all uh, uh, be eventually phased out when, when the definitive period comes into place in 2026 and uh, exporters actually need to uh, pay a price for CBAM certificates. Um, so now what we see both at the EU and at an international level is that there are some uh, policy responses that are being adopted on both sides, both from third countries and from the EU. Uh, and this is really the time uh, to act. So we have recently published a paper on how to turn CBAM as a tool for green development, which I'm, I'm happy to share uh, with everyone later on and expand on our recommendations uh, if it's of interest. But basically what we see is that uh, on the one hand, developing countries and businesses are starting to act. So some countries, as it was mentioned already in the G7, but also countries like Brazil and Indonesia are starting to explore uh, adopting their own carbon pricing schemes. Businesses are trying to move towards renewables to, to green their, uh, uh, their production. And at the same time, the EU uh, is also try starting to assess the, the impacts on developing countries. So one thing, for instance, that the EU needs to do before the definitive period kicks in in 2026 is that it needs to submit a report to the European Parliament where it assesses a variety of things, basically how the mechanism, how the mechanism worked during the transitional period. And one of the things that it needs to assess and to look into is the impact on developing countries and uh, to what extent the measures that are in place and the support that the EU is providing is being effective or to what extent it needs to be uh, well stepped up. Um, and this is the, the rationale behind the transitional period, right? Uh, 
So in our view, and I mean, I will skip uh, the part where we talk about developing countries because it has been said already, but in our view, what we call for in our paper is for the EU, for the European Commission in this case, but for the EU as a whole, to step up and to fine tune commitments, uh, technical and financial uh, assistance commitments to developing countries. Because the truth of the matter is, uh, the, the first, there, there's still a lack of knowledge as also we have heard from the speaker from South Africa, about the impact that the measure will have on developing countries. It will impact uh, partner countries differently. Uh, it will uh, impact industries within a given country differently. So uh, one thing that we suggest would, would be to, on the developing country side, to have some sort of like decarbonization impact assessment and see to what extent the CBAM will impact decarbonization efforts in on their own country. And in our view, this is something that it's in the interest of both third countries to see what kind of preparation and what kind of measures do they also need to put in place or they should, or and if their views is then to try to to divert their export to other countries, then be it. But then there would be like a better understanding and awareness about the impacts on uh, of the CBAM on their own decarbonization pathway. Um, so this is something that in our view should be supported by the European Commission. Um, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go as far as saying um, in all third, uh, third countries, but at least on the ones that are expected to be the most impacted. And then on the other hand, what we believe is that the type of support in place should reflect the different kind of exposure and vulnerability of partner countries on this measure. And by exposure and vulnerability, I can expand on it also later on if it's needed, but there is the World Bank Exposure Index that is publicly available and everyone can consult, but it basically measures the level of exposure of a third country depending on the level of exports of these commodities to the EU. And by vulnerability, I mean, what kind of infrastructure, what kind of national capabilities their countries have in place, right? Because countries, for instance, that already have a carbon pricing systems, exporters are more familiar with when it comes to measuring emissions. Um, there is other sorts of like monitoring systems in place. So this is something that should also be reflected on the type of support. So at this point, as I said, the transitional period will end at the end of 2025. And um, there are some things already in place, but there are some things that still need to be implemented. And uh, one thing that we call for is um, for the EU to build on existing initiatives. So there are a few things that are already in place. As I said, there is the global get gateway. There is uh, JETPs, the Just Energy Transition Partnerships that, for instance, exist with uh, South Africa, Indonesia, and some other countries. Uh, that the overall purpose of these measures, uh, of these partnerships, of course, it's not when they were designed, it's not to help compliance to, uh, with, the, with CBAM, but they could be used for those purposes to help these countries green their greed, to help... Uh, for instance, build a national green hydrogen uh, economies. And of course, the purpose shouldn't be just to produce green hydrogen and export it to the EU, but help them like green and decarbonize their own industries. So this is one thing that we think that it should be leveraged better going forward. Existing partnerships that are already in place. There is also a partnership on uh, on green hydrogen that, the, that exists with Egypt. So whenever these na national uh, uh, natural resources exist, I think uh, these partnerships could really help these third, uh, third countries green their grid. And then uh, the EU has also recently set up a carbon pricing task force. Uh, well, it remains to be seen. There isn't much information available on how this uh, task force is going, is going to work out in practice. But the idea would be to uh, of the EU was to set up this carbon pricing task force to support third countries that are interested in setting up their own carbon pricing systems. And th there are many, as I've mentioned, to see to what extent their mechanisms will be compatible with the EU, because at the end of the day, if uh, an, a, a company pays carbon price at home and it needs to be, according to the CBAM regulation, an effective carbon price, it doesn't need to pay to the EU. Uh, and I will wrap up uh, very briefly. I'm sorry, I see your, your, your signs. Um, so this carbon pricing um, task force is in place and it should be used to more than help third countries uh, adopt systems that are compatible to the EU, but also to explore equivalences and alternative um, schemes. And then uh, third, and I will be very brief, uh, is the CBAM revenues. In our view, 
uh, the CBAM revenues should be repurposed to support uh, those third countries. Like this is a commitment that the the the, the Commission should uh, make because, as has been mentioned, the ETS revenues, the revenues coming from the European um, uh, oh, emissions trading system in the EU also are repurposed to EU businesses. So in our view, it's only fair that the CBAM revenue should also be used to provide financial and uh, technical assistance to third countries. And I'll stop it at that. Thank you, Claudia. That was, uh, that was extremely interesting. And also uh, the last point, especially that you made is something that uh, countries, party countries have been uh, repeatedly making. Uh, before we go to the questions, there are some very interesting ones that I can see in the, uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, I'd like to go to Anandita, and if you could uh, please, um, uh, you know, share your perspective in the in five in five minutes, and then we can come back to some very interesting questions that we we already have. Sure. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say thanks to all the panelists here. I think some great points were raised, and um, it has given me the chance to sort of map all of those uh, in my head. Uh, and with some reference to the paper that I published earlier, um, I would like to provide some sort of insights and build on the points which have already been discussed. Um, so starting with the, the issue about, uh, you know, the climate justice and how, how much is the CBAM in violation or uh, of, of the CBDR principle. Um, I think one point to start with is to actually look into the logic by, you know, on the basis of which the CBAM was actually implemented or, you know, initiated. Um, so on one hand, you have the EU, which says that, okay, so there are two different kinds of environmental standards that are being placed here. We have a very high, high level of climate commitments that we want to achieve within the EU, whereas you have non-EU countries which have relatively lax environmental standards, right? And this creates this risk of carbon leakage. The issue here is that we have identified this difference in environmental standards as an issue, right? Because of which we want to create a border adjustment and we want to implement a border measure uh, to do it. The irony here, or I, I do agree with some points uh, that the EU has put forth, but they have introduced this as a climate measure. In comparison, a lot of the BRICS nations and uh, developing economies see this more as a protectionist measure from the other point of view. They, they, they see it as a trade barrier. Um, but when it when we want to look at to the uh, look at this from a climate discourse perspective, we have to understand that there is an intrinsic misalignment here with the Paris Agreement in itself, because um, the Paris Agreement laid down uh, or allowed countries to you know have. Uh, you know, determine their national uh, contributions, their, their goals, uh, establish their short-term and long-term goals based on their own specific developmental needs, resource capacity, and historical contributions to climate change. Uh, in response, you have CBAM, which talks about this discrepancy and says, hey, we'll just come in and we'll start to manage this through a border adjustment mechanism. So there is this misalignment right, uh, between the Paris, what the Paris Agreement was trying to achieve and what the EU was trying to do here. And we see the same logic being represented by uh, or being taken forth by other G7 countries as well. Now, this can take up in the form of uh, this can this has come up in the form of their own border adjustment uh, mechanisms, but also in the form of climate clubs. We saw in December 22 where you had the GS G7 coming together to form a climate club, and uh, we we've seen conversations between uh, the EU and the US that have spoken about creating climate climate club around aluminium and uh, steel. So these kinds of conversations have to be uh, discussed, not in isolation, but together, uh, where you see this discrepancy between the trade and climate discourse taking place. And in the lead up to, in the lead up to COP29, I think this is a very important point to be highlighted. Um, the other issues of revenues, uh, which Claudia mentioned, and I appreciate that, that there is this need to you know, repurpose CBAM revenues. Because uh, as a lot of studies and you know platforms have discussed that this is in violation of the CBDR principle, because the understanding that comes from CBDR is that um, there is a need for from uh, for climate finance to flow from developed to developing economies, and that is in accordance with the CBDR principle. So when you have revenues that are being generated from CBAM, a CBAM supposedly, you have the idea that it doesn't get repurposed towards developing economies, 
And as we know that uh, some estimates show that we have, you know, about 1.5 billion euros worth of uh, uh, revenues per year till 2028 have been mentioned. And that um, those revenues will be divided by 75% uh, going towards the European budget and 25 going towards the national budgets of those of European Union countries. So in contrast to the climate finance discussion, which talks about your you know, new, uh, climate finance goal, the amount of money, the 100 billion goal, which is now coming down to the new quantitative goal, uh, collective quantitative goal, which also is going to be discussed at the COP29, uh, kind of you know, seems in contrast to this climate discourse as a trade measure. And I think these, these nuances need to be hashed out more in detail. I understand that um, a point that Amit and Sir had actually mentioned that uh, multilateral, uh, you know, conversations might not actually be very uh, fruitful. Now, this uh, point was raised by ADB as well when they were talking about the issues regarding WTO uh, rules and saying how CBAM is, you know, uh, not, uh, also not in uh, congruence with WTO rules, mainly focusing, mainly uh, violating the. Uh, uh, the national treatment and um, the most favored nation rules of the WTO. Um, but the issue here is, which the ADB report also had mentioned, that despite the trade, the uh, dispute resolution mechanism and its own just intrinsic challenges, that this may actually st still take up, say, about say 30 months. So in that interim period where the dispute resolution is actually taking place, there will still be short-term impacts which are going to be, you know, borne by your non-EU producers, which also which need to be taken into consideration. So um, that is that disconnect between the national and international level conversations, and in that interim period where your, you know, industries are still bearing that cost. Um, the third point I would like to talk about is awareness. So uh, something that uh, Sutame had mentioned, that there's this lack of awareness around CBAM. Um, I think I completely agree because um, I have not done, like this has not been a part of my research as of now, but you know, just uh, sort of informal discussion with some of the industry participants and exporters to the EU. Uh, I feel that um, they are, uh, there's a lack of awareness about what is needed. There's also been some lack about a lack of awareness about what is CBAM. And there's also lack of information about, uh, you know, what, what do we have to do about this? And even if it is in place, we haven't really, you know, faced any consequences in person. Now, bear in mind, this has been like a very informal discussion. This is not a proper research. Uh, but it is important to have an industry, you know, input as to what have you, uh, what has been your experience so far. And what do you think is required as you are transitioning towards or as these requirements are being born by you? Because what I feel is going to happen is that till this point, till, till the default values can be used, it can be used up. One, there are challenges with the default values itself. But uh, at some point when the costs start to come in, um, at that point of time, it will just be a reactionary response and we will not be at the forefront and we will not be able to make the decisions that we would have wanted to make. So I think industry level input is extremely important here. Um, from just the trade impact perspective, I think uh, some points which were, I think, uh, echoed here and, here and there in the panel, um, I feel just to summarize that, I think trade impact is um, a factor of two, three major things. One being, uh, you know, the emission intensity of production, the other being the export dependence of those goods to the, to the EU. And the third being your carbon pricing policy, the domestic carbon pricing policy. There are some amplifying factors also where, wherein your, uh, it's possible that countries, the impact of CBAM can differ based on um, at a sectoral level. So for India, for instance, you have the most exposed sector by these three criteria could be, or the first two criteria could be iron and steel, but it could be, uh, you know, fertilizers for uh, Georgia and aluminium for Kazakhstan. Uh, but the overall impact might be limited. You know, like the it, the impact may actually differ based on different criteria. But it is important to know that these three uh, criteria uh, uh, point factors are actually very important. Uh, some of the amplifying factors which can actually enhance the impact. Are, um, and points of concerns for sure are, um, you know, the gradual decrease in free allowances. So even though EU itself has set its own pace of reduction based on its own climate commitments, uh, to be able to trans you know, uh, transition based on those commitments might be quite impractical for, uh, you know, industry players, non-EU industry players. 
Um, the other issue is of default values that again, there is no stake of the non-EU producers in what kind, what is the process. As of now, the information is about um, how if the global global level values are being used for default values, and uh, when the definitive period can, kicks in, uh, then country wise values will be used. So in an, uh, in a situation where we lack technical capabilities, and uh, industry players have to rely on default values, and sometimes those values might misrepresent what the actual emissions are. So it's possible possible that you start incurring like a higher uh, financial obligation. So uh, this is where the government and the policymakers need to step in and you know uh, identify these uh, points of um, pain and see that what could be uh, you know uh, stopped before it goes too big. Um, and I feel the last thing which I feel is really really important is the carbon pricing. Uh, one, the exposure from the fluctuations in the EU ETS price that uh, non-EU producers are going to face. I think we have seen incredible amount of fluctuations within 2023. I, I think at, um, 2023, it was about 80 to 100. Uh, in Feb 22, it went down to something around 50. And you have different kinds of you know, internal and external factors that affect the carbon, the EU ETS. Now, this is not just the only level of issue, the, the le level of concern. Um, you can also have an issue in terms of carbon pricing disparity. So if, even if you have a nation, say Korea, which, is, which has uh, its own ETS, um, one, it's a, how good or how mature your market is, is dependent on the amount of time it has spent in you know, learning from its market participants and becoming mature and making you know, iterations or tweaks to its own design, how much should be the free allocation or how much should be the pricing system, auctioning system. And um, the disparity as uh, Suta made also uh, you know, noted that uh, is quite high. So the protection from CBAM at that level uh, is quite uh, uh, you know, high. And uh, sorry, <laughs> the protection is quite low. So I feel uh, that uh, these are some of the amplifiers which will also be looked into. And uh, yes, I think that should be it for my first initial remarks. Thank you, Arunita. This is really, really good. Uh, and uh, two, three things that I want to come back to you now on uh, uh, so questions. But first, we'll take some questions from the audience because we have some very interesting ones. And uh, I think uh, there's one anonymous question. Uh, Aruna, ma'am, this is for you, uh, uh, asking you to touch upon a little bit more on uh, embedded carbon. And Amitendu, after that, if I can go to you with this question uh, by uh, Shubrata, uh, asking to understand a little bit more on the impact on MSMEs in India, which is, uh, ma'am, even you could touch upon that a little bit. Because uh, once we understand the, understand the impacts, maybe we can talk a little bit about solutions and we'll come to you, Claudia, after that, uh, because there are a couple of interesting questions there too. So, uh, ma'am, if you'd like to go first and then Amitindu. You're on mute, ma'am. So, uh, you know, when you look at the embodied uh, carbon or embodied carbon, what you will see, you go into the entire value chain. It starts off from the mining, the mechanisms you are doing it, the logistics, the mode of transportation. Are you doing with slurry pipelines, the raw material, or it is by trucks, or it is by train? So what kind of uh, emissions that are happening with it? Then what is the uh, your source of making the uh, the end product. So, so whether it is a coal based or whether it is a scrap based. And here I like to make a mention that EU manufactures more than 99% scrap. So in the sense their emissions are at a very low value. So uh, that is how it is working on. And then how you source the entire thing and how much of recycling you are doing it. Then again, it goes back to uh, scrap based kind of a thing. So that is what you understand by the embodied carbon. Now, when you look at it, definitely it takes time. And uh, uh, what Mr. Uh, Amitendu was mentioning very clearly, that India is seriously thinking in the steam to have a different mechanisms of the route of production. So for exports, they will go by the scrap-based DRI route, non-coal-based routes, so that you know they have the measurements which are which have the minimalistic uh, embodied carbon into it. 
and of course the emissions is negligible it is less than one or nearing one it comes whereas the normal is 2.5 of carbon dioxide emissions so that advantage they will take to be in the to have their foot in the export market even though it makes only eight to nine percent of the exports then the second question what you were mentioning about uh, is uh, yes uh, what one problem, you know, you have to understand that it is being used by EU as one of the non-tariff barrier and the cost which they are going to use in these uh, two years time is going to be uh, basically to enhance their local production and bring down their exports. So, so that is the clear intention. Uh, Claudia can expand it more if need be when you are going ahead with it. And then when you're talking of the MSMEs, the MSMEs, which are scrap-based exports, making alloys with it, it will not have any negative impact. But which are on the induction uh, furnace-based, coal-based, it is going to have a terrible, terrible adverse impact. It will push them out completely from this export market for at least a decade because that entire conversion, uh, the technology and the cost uh, investments is not small. But yes, the Ministry of Steel is discussing with them and they have recently come up with the green carbon policy and they have uh, sort of issued it. So it is going to work because uh, you define first what it is and identify the places where uh, government has to do a little bit of hat holding. Because what Claudia said is very correct that uh, the concern of the government is fine. We have to go for the low carbon emission. But the guiding factor has to be the pace and what is our acceptable norm? So in India, if the acceptable norm is 1.8, 1.9 of carbon emission, then the industry will work towards it. It cannot be lower than that. Right. And maybe they'll have a differentiated thing, what uh, Mr. Palit was mentioning, uh, something for the exports and something for the Indian thing, which is, which is very complex, very difficult, and uh, 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 it'll create more confusion, no doubt about it. But just to have a foothold foot, foot there, uh, that may be the answer. So MSMEs on the right kind of a route, a DRI, non-coal-based, scrap-based route, absolutely no problem. So their alloy making or their steel making, because these are the major sectors uh, which is going to get impacted as well as the exports to the EU or G7 countries are concerned. It will not be a problem. And and uh, they survived even with, you know, Section 212 uh, extra uh, cost which was put by U U.S., you know, they were able to sort of combat it and started manufacturing within US, invested in US and started manufacturing there to escape it. So, so these kind of norms will happen. So we have to understand very clearly that even though the curtain is of CBAM, which is a very good curtain, I don't deny that the concern has to be to accelerate towards it. But the idea is to have a non-tariff barrier and generate funds to enhance the local capacity of manufacturing so that their dependency on imports come down. I think I've addressed both of them. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Amitendu, if we can come to uh, come to you with this, uh, not just the impact on MSMEs, I see that you have uh, responded to uh, some of the questions uh, here, but if you can elaborate a little bit more on the solutions, because one thing that you're saying is very interesting is that then the conversations uh, although this, this is a multilateral uh, issue and it's affecting mul multiple countries, the solutions seem to be now uh, going into huddles of uh, bilateral conversations and uh, and where, where you're talking MFN st status, you're looking at uh, smaller groups of nations coming together and seeing whether they have their solutions. Is that where world trade will go? Will this also, I mean, this is a question for me, will this also shrink world trade in some ways, uh, at least initially, or are we seeing a fundamental shift in the way we do business in the next five, 10 years? Chana, I think, uh, yeah, firstly, I must uh, congratulate the attendees for the questions. Very interesting questions. And I was able to answer a couple of those. And I'm happy to sort of probe on this further and come back to you through the questions that you have raised. Uh, look, I think uh, we, we are seeing a few parallel trends that are emerging together. If you look at, let's say, the European Union. So the European Union has been in most matters uh, related to global trade and global rulemaking. The European Union has usually been a rule setter. 
I mean, that's a role which the European Union has played for a very long time in many respects. So it's not unexpected that they would have uh, brought in regulations or rules in order to tackle uh, the whole issue of decarbonization through unilateral uh, measures like the CBAM. Now, the problem over here is that what exactly is the way the CBAM gives a direction to the rest of the world in terms of tackling carbon? See, there's a, there's a chicken and egg condition here. The chicken and egg condition is that if several countries feel that border carbon taxes are the way forward, you know, for stopping carbon leakage, then you end up creating more market access barriers. But if several countries don't feel that way and they actually feel that the border carbon adjustment needs to be thought through, then there is a problem here. The problem arises because of the fact that one would feel, number one, the European Union should have probably embarked on this after a wider range of consultations. Number two, there are some issues over how the European Union is going to domestically price carbon within its economy. What is the methodology? What is the understanding? What are the guiding assumptions from that? From whatever work that I and my colleagues have done, there does not seem to be a very clear understanding on this in the beginning. And then the third point, that if there is a progressive increase in the domestic price of carbon within the European Union, the degree of competitiveness that you are seeing outside the European Union will have to be taxed at the border by the European principles. So that's a complicated situation. Now, in that case, if we look at the supply chain, what does that mean? When, let's say, for example, if we are talking about what is going on between India and the European Union. Now, India as a country has a strong enough clout to convince the European Union to bring the CBAM within the fold of its free trade agreement discussions. And there might be India-specific carve-outs, which might come out, out of this, but not all countries have that clout. I think that's something which is very important to accept. So what's the way forward for those countries? Naturally, they all can't act like the way India has done. At the same time, they are very conscious about the impact on their supply chains. Why? Because there is a view that CBAM is essentially impacting the larger companies, which unfortunately I don't think is correct because the larger companies tend to outsource a lot of their production to medium-sized companies. And in a number of cases, these medium-sized companies are also in the partly formal sector. Let's say in a country like India or many other developing countries, it's partly in the formal sector. So then what happens is that there is clearly a, mismatch between capacities and understanding as far as complying to the requirements of CBAM are concerned purely from a reporting and compliance sense and that increases procedural costs of operation. I mean this urchana is very similar to the fact that you know we have seen through various studies that a large number of free trade agreements don't have much use. They are not used much. Why are they not used much? Because there is an information cost of using their fees. And that information cost is very high on part of medium enterprises because they don't understand the FTA dynamics, the rules of origin and so on and so forth. So they just completely avoid looking at FTAs, right? So where's the incentive on part of MSMEs to actually support the new compliance requirements that are coming in? This is where the big companies will be in a catch-22 situation. And that's where the government really needs to consider this step-by-step, action-by-action to think what is going to happen. I will conclude with one thought. You know, when we look at this question of conversations within the free trade agreements, free trade agreements give the contracting parties a lot of liberty to talk on a large number of issues. So let's say, for example, if we look at ASEAN and Southeast Asia today, right? the ASEAN and Southeast Asia are discussing a lot about what we call the new generation issues. Let's say, for example, the digital economy. There's a lot of talk that is going on about labor mobility within the region. Similarly, environment can come. And they need not talk about border carbon adjustment, but even if they start talking about development of a regional global carbon pricing market, you would have gone one step ahead in actually making sense within the block 
that look, we are not going to act upon border measures because that's going to impact trade, but rather we will try to bring in place ways of pricing carbon domestically, so much so that we are able to live up to the expectations that we have from our stakeholders in development that we will be able to achieve the SDG goals in proximate future. So this is where the multilateral conversation is handicapped. The multilateral conversation is not moving forward at all on this agenda because there are so many other low-hanging fruits. The fisheries subsidies, for example, which is yet to be concluded, you know, the public stockholding and many other issues. I really don't see any possibility of this getting addressed at the multilateral forum at any point in time in the foreseeable future. What is perhaps possible is to make some breakthroughs through broader regional groups. But then again, the challenge is that if you see a country like India, who do you see India negotiating this with? European Union, yes, possible, because it, it's still in the works. It's a process in the works. Do we see this, for example, India negotiating with a country like Sri Lanka? Do we see this India negotiating with ASEAN? It's not going to be easy. So I suspect that there will have to be issue-specific conversations on this. And the businesses will have to play a much more proactive role in this regard because it is actually businesses who are getting impacted much more than the governments. So I think that's where the conversation needs to shift to a level where businesses must talk much more freely within themselves and including the MSME enterprises. Interesting. I uh, What you're saying, all points taken well. I, I'm just uh, also a little amused at how little WTO and its uh, uh, erstwhile importance in uh, solving, resolving issues has not come up in this discussion uh, as a viable option uh, for for finding a solution out of this. But I will come to Claudia now. And thanks for that, Avdendu. But uh, I see an interesting question that, uh, Adna ma'am, you have answered for Disha Shetty. But I think it's a, it's something that I also would like to hear a little bit more on in terms of, uh, is there any effort uh, to include technology players uh, uh, in this in the CBAM? And uh, it sounds like CBAM could push up prices in the, for end goods for European users. In that case, is a pushback expected? That is the question that Disha is asking. If you could address that for me. Uh, as far as I am aware, uh, within the EU, the pushback is not so uh, loud because as, as I said at the beginning, uh, there is an ETS, right? So for an, from an European business perspective, it's considered that the CBAM is leveling the playing field, even though that the, the official like EU line is that CBAM is a, a, a tool to fight uh, the risk uh, of carbon leakage for EU businesses. This is how they see it, a tool for to level the playing field, because since they will have to pay domestic carbon price. So in their view, it's only fair that third countries have to pay as well. Also to avoid like businesses in the EU to, to locate uh, abroad. So at least, I mean, I've been following the discussion since the, the, the norm, the, the regulation was adopted. And I think the, the pushback within the EU is not as uh, uh, as prominent as the outside uh, a pushback. Uh, but then uh, if I may like pick up on, on a few points also to, to give a bit more uh, clarity on the type of assistance that could be provided. I think like the one thing that um, I think several several speakers have already mentioned, but it, it, it has to do with technical assistance, with the fact that like smaller business, smaller uh, businesses, yeah, with, regardless where where they are, right, regardless of the type of development, uh, the development level of a given country, like smaller businesses will have more difficulties in complying with CBAM than bigger businesses, right? And this is for several reasons, but one of them is the fact that um, like there, are, there is a lack of monitoring, reporting, and verification systems in place. So one thing that I think the EU could for sure step up uh, their game would to be is with regards to uh, technical assistance, helping training exporters, measure emissions, uh, comply with the, um, uh, even come up with the, with their own values, right? Because as it was mentioned, uh, default values will only they are only in place at least as of now. And I know that there are some discussions whether to extend these the default values and allow exporters to use them in the definitive period. But as of now, I mean, this will not be a, a possibility, right? Um, 
So one thing that you could do in a, apart from setting up the technical assistance would be to, to introduce other flexibilities as in the default values being used for a longer period or rethinking the default values that are considered uh, punitive by, by some countries because they are, it's, it's an average, right? Um, also the type of methodology because during the, the, the transitional period, um, the exporters can use different methodologies and after that period they will have to comply with the EU methodology. So all of these um, flexibilities could uh, be it's something that the EU could consider. Um, another thing, and it was also uh, mentioned, it has to do with, um, with international cooperation, right? Because um, I mean, and you still talked about the WTO. One thing that the WTO has tried to do, and I mean, uh, the success uh, of, of this initiative is yet to be seen, uh, is that the WTO uh, Director General uh, launched a task force at the international level uh, to come up with a global uh, carbon pricing system. Uh, it's something that is not only a WTO initiative. So I, I heard that the UNFCCC has joined the, the, the task force. Uh, UNCTAD, ITC, IMF, World Bank, so it's a, a common uh, initiative and the idea is to have a, a global system. They're looking at the differentiated prices depending on the level of development, which raises a, a number of other issues like uh, where does China fall, how, who classifies the countries as developed or developing, and the truth of the matter is up to this day, um, it's uh, I, I, at least at a personal level, I'm not so uh, confident that this will initiative will uh, will bear some fruits, or at least not in the anytime soon, or at least for sure not uh, before the definitive period of the of the CBAP kicks in. So in the meantime, what do we do? Uh, and I think one way that third countries uh, could and, and should, in my view, engage with the with the EU is through the EU's own task force for carbon pricing. If there, but this is only valid for countries who are considering carbon pricing, right? So those countries, and there are many, as I said, it's not the majority or it's not all of them, I would say, that are considering can engage with the EU through this task force, see what are in their view, what is in their view acceptable, whether, well, even if it's just like a, an initial engagement, right, to make up their mind whether it is worth at national level for them to set up a carbon price or not. So this is one way in which third countries can engage with the EU. Then in our view, uh, also, there are some countries with a high level of exposure and high levels of vulnerability, which for sure are not the vast majority. Uh, but countries like Mozambique that are uh, highly uh, exposed or disproportionately exposed in these cases, I, I see, and I'm not saying that it's only Mozambique, but it's the, it's the case that is a bit more uh, prominent than LDC. It, you know, it relies heavily on exports of aluminium to the EU. So in cases of countries like Mozambique, they are highly exposed. One way, I think it's it's not only financial assistance, uh, not only technical assistance, but maybe financial assistance uh, as well. Um, and then one more thing, uh, if, if I might just add uh, at the WTO level as well, because something that we have called for, because as I said, this global task force for a global carbon price, I mean, it's at least not on time for, for, for the definitive period for sure will not be uh, agreed at the multilateral level. But there are other things that the WTO could do. And one thing that we call for is a, a sort of compatibility forum, like a place at the multilateral level where countries could discuss this. There are some, some uh, initiatives at the plurilateral level. At the OECD, there is a G7 uh, climate club, but uh, well, most of them lack uh, some key players like China. Um, and uh, well, it's just a group of like-minded countries, right? And then. The, my final point is that, of course, CBAM is very important and is the topic of the session. But at the end of the day, different countries are adopting different measures, right? CBAM is one of the many trade-related climate measures adopted at the international level. And of course, there is, like carbon pricing is very popular. I think there are over like 70 carbon pricing schemes in place. So there is a need for harmonizing, for, for harmonization. So this is one thing. But if we look at the bigger picture, there's also a need to have a space at the international level where the different measures are discussed and well compared. So not only CBAM, but deforestation, subsidies. So, and this is where the WTO can can play a role uh, as well. A quick question on that, because you're saying the WTO can play a role. Can this also be brought into the uh, U.S. Is there a legend? Mm -hmm. This is that also one of your recommendations? Um, yeah. So, so this is some. Um, and we're talking uh, justice, climate justice. Quickly. Yeah. Exactly. 
I will be very quickly, but this is something that started uh, last year mainly. So up until very recently, the UNFCCC wasn't the place where people will discuss trade. Last year, there was a trade day, and this is something that came up during the negotiations as well. Several countries, India, Brazil, brought up the question of like unilateral measures to the, to the UNFCCC. So it seems to, to, there seems to exist at least a group of countries that believe that trade should be discussed at UNFCCC. I think this could be one, one way to go around it. There's also several, several submissions at the WTO, uh, like on trade-related climate measures. So I think in my view, one way forward would be a joint effort. Um, so for some, to, uh, because at the end of the day, these are trade and climate measures, right? So it's only fair that both climate and trade organizations uh, host these discussions. In the ideal world, if this is possible, well, then I, I guess uh, we'll, we'll see. Thank you so much. I had a question for Sudami also, and uh, if I can ask him to come in quickly, and then uh, uh, Anandita, I see we have very little time left. We have only 10 minutes left. So quick question for you, Sudami. One, what kind of thinking is there when it comes to, because you talked about uh, uh, information asymmetry, you've talked about the fact that uh, African supply chains are uh, going to be affected smaller business uh, businesses we've been talking about how msmes will be affected but how is uh, how are policymakers uh, looking at cbam like india is looking at an fta what are african countries looking at also as critical mineral suppliers to the eu is that uh, one of the levers that is being discussed as uh, you know part of the discussions uh, uh, in terms of how trade will be how how trade can be or the rules of trade between EU and Africa will be affected? Is there any discussion on that? Um, yes, yeah, so um, on the critical minerals, so there's, there has been a lot of discussion around that. Um, but on the CBAM front, so we, we've seen, for example, the African group, the WTO also highlighting the position on, on, on for example, on CBAM. And I think just to add on what Claudia has already said, um, there is, uh, we, we see that, for example, looking at the principles of both the WTO and the UNFCCC, you know, specifically looking at uh, the special different differentiated treatment as well as the common but differentiated uh, responsibilities and, and, and respective capabilities. So we've seen this, you know, um, you know, happening, you know, in parallel, but they, they were not necessarily, you know, discussed at the, for example, at the multilateral level, discussed you know combining climate change and trade. So, um, I think also to just build on Lydia's um point that, for example, from last year we've started seeing you know this happening, and hopefully you know as uh, for example some of the progress that the WTO is making is um is gonna you know uplift or put for example the global south you know at an advantage. Right. But, you know, coming back to, to the policy side of things in, you know, locally, um, I mean, as I mentioned, there's a, a need to, um, you know, engage or, you know, um, build some capacity around the policymakers in, in the continent. We're only seeing this, for example, in South Africa, in Mozambique. In Mozambique, there has been a lot of consultancy supporting policies there. Um, then in the, you know, North Africa, we start seeing some debate. I think Morocco now they are, you know, also starting to think of introducing carbon pricing, right? So we will start to see, you know, this, you know, developing in the continent. But of course, I think as much as we're focusing on CBAM, um, you know, a broader conversation needs to, to be had, especially around including um, you know, um, for example, the deforestation free supply chain, because there are other, you know, for example, agricultural products that come from the continent. So they are also critical minerals that comes from the continent. So, I mean, all these are, are all linked and maybe the conversation shouldn't be centered around, um, you know, our CBAM, but, you know, specifically focusing on, on um, you know, climate change and trade measures. For example, you know, we start seeing this, for example, started having the base of conversation around the European Green Deal. So I think we're moving in the, you know, in the right direction. But the important thing is that there should be uh, increased awareness. So, and in the South African case, we we've been engaging with uh, industries, um, you know, doing a lot of workshops around, um, you know, trying to educate or you know make uh, some you know stakeholders in 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 the country to be more aware of of CBM and to act more proactively than you know reacting to such measures. Thank you, Sudami. 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 Thank you, Sud
Thanks so much, Sita. Thank you. If I can come to you, Anandita, because there's an interesting question. Uh, you here, uh, Sita may just spoke about carbon pricing. Uh, Amitendu has raised that. Uh, so has Claudia. Uh, if you can talk a little bit about carbon pricing and the fact uh, and this interesting question by Aparna, uh, which talks about uh, can I see it on whether uh, there can be pooling of ETS. That was Aparna's question, I think, or has it been answered? If you could talk a little bit about ETS and whether there can be uh, the Global South cooperation of interlinking ETS is, is, can be one of the possible solutions or mechanism for developing countries to combat sea bank. Do you think that's workable? A short answer, please. Sure. <clears throat> so I think that's a really good question. Um, the way the ETS functions by design is that it needs to uh, create a price incentive enough for, uh, you know, to in create an incentive for uh, industry players to actually transition. So when you have very many participants with extremely different priorities and different developmental concerns and different uh, specific circumstances, uh, having a combined ETS might be an issue. The other point is that when uh, this actually links to one of the suggestions that I would want, I wanted to give um, uh, in terms of having, you know, trade related, uh, what kind of discussions need to take priority. Um, one thing is definitely so what is considered uh, under the scope of carbon pricing, domestic carbon pricing that should definitely be looked into. As of now, you have an ETS or uh, a carbon tax system that is being considered broadly speaking. But you also have, um, you know, if you have a country which has linked its ETS with the EU, that that is not under the scope of uh, CBAM, right? So uh, that does provide some incentive, but it should be, uh, you know, carried out with caution because the fluctuations from a different market are going to be impact what is happening at the domestic level. Um, so I think uh, uh, different kinds of uh, conversations around uh, carbon pricing as well as uh, carbon markets for instance, articles uh, six of the Paris Agreement, those negotiations are being taken place, uh, are expected to take place in the COP29 as well. And there's been, uh, you know, it's been quite delayed on that uh, level. Um, but I think the idea of whether or not, for instance, projects which are being used under Article 6 as an international carbon market uh, system, should would those be considered as a part of, um, can those be considered as a part of, like, say, CBAM, towards CBAM's financial obligation? So I think, yes, there is definitely a need to explore different kinds of uh, mechanisms and using both bilateral and uh, uh, multilateral, as we've discussed, might be quite challenging. Uh, but using those discussion platforms to actually talk about what actually can be considered from the domestic viewpoint. Fair enough. But that's a, that's a good answer. If uh, we have like a final three minutes left, so if I can uh, come back to a question that Sargon had asked actually, and uh, maybe we can uh, broaden this out a little. I'd like to come back to you, ma'am, on this, uh, Arna ma'am, because uh, the question, and to you, Amitendu, because uh, is there then a broader solution? Should we be looking at, uh, is there some way where we can bring both sides together and uh, have a broader conversation that uh, marries trade and climate and look at solutions. Well, we talked about having it at uh, UNFCCC and at uh, FTAs through FTAs and through uh, bilateral agreements. But uh, is there, where do you see this these conversations fitting in what form? Is there any specific solution? You want me to go first? Okay. Uh, see, frankly speaking, for European Union to have differential CBAM rates by different countries, is the, and uh, it is not possible. So let us be very clear that bilateral will not be a solution on it. May give an op, op uh, like, uh, you know, make good headlines, but that is not going to help anyway. Yeah. Yeah. What is more important is to the statement which Claudia mentioned of intention to share this money collected. Mm -hmm. If that handholding can be insisted upon, so that uh, you know, if if European Union's concern is climate, right, then there should not be a problem to have this exchange rate. And if their intention is to create a non-tariff barrier and encourage the investments and collect this money for the local manufacturer, then this is not going to happen. So in case they are ready to share with it, then it will accelerate the pace of the exports 
to match up to the standards which an importing country has. So India may set its own standards for our internal consumption and claim it to be green steel. But the moment you enter the export, the importing country standard you will have. So I think there is no escape from that. Thank you. Right. Thank you. It was very succinct and very, uh, very <laughs> <obvious. laughs> How Do you agree with Mom? Is there anything you can add? Quickly. So now let me uh, put it this way that look, I believe a solution is definitely possible. There are enough forums, enough frameworks because uh, the advantage that we have is that there is a clear understanding of the problem in the sense that uh, climate change has to be addressed, decarbonization has to be encouraged, trade and climate are you know inseparably linked. So that is an issue and that, that part is fine. But there's one problem. The problem is there's always a risk in a unilateral step. And let me give you the example that I have on my mind. Let's see that today the European Union has come up with the CMAP, right? And there are other countries which might come up with border carbon adjustments. The idea is that this is going to help aid and abate decarbonization. Now, if you put this together with the fact that these might again be the same countries which are putting tariffs or countervailing duties on cheap imports of electric vehicles into their territories, then the problem that arises is that by doing so, you are not helping climate, right? Yeah. Adoption of cheap electric vehicles in your public transport systems would have helped achieve the climate goal. So on one hand, one tariff measure is for supporting climate. The other tariff measure is not for supporting climate. What this means is you don't create trust. Yeah. And recovery of trust is absolutely essential for going forward on this conversation because otherwise, uh, the point that uh, Dr. Aruna mentioned and Anindita also mentioned, yeah. why is the CBAM being looked at as a protective measure and for national interests? The problem of climate is a global problem. It's not a national problem, right? Yes. So I think that understanding has to proceed on the basis of trust and there are contradictions that are eroding that trust. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know we've run out of time, but if, can I ask your indulgence for just a couple more minutes? Because there was one question uh, from Gaurav from PTI. He's been waiting for a while, uh, actually, to ask this question. Uh, quick uh, intervention uh, by any of y'all. Uh, his question was about China, and this is one elephant in the room that really never came up. He wanted to understand the context uh, of China, and uh, he says that whatever he has gathered from uh, conversations with uh, people monitoring China is that it has not said anything outside the UNFCCC negotiations. Uh, so it means that it is going to comply. How does this impact the decision? Uh, for countries like India, as well as countries in Africa or other global south, that it may or may not be standing with the global south. On this last one, uh, any of y'all, if y'all can take this. I'll open I'm it. happy yeah. to uh, respond to this because, uh, look, I, I, I think personally that global south, and this I uh, responded to in one of my uh, answers, I think the global south by itself is, a, is, is, is an idea. The global south is not a structure. We have a very long way to go before we actually obtain a structure for the Global South because the idea of Global South is totally conceptual. It's an understanding. All members of Global South consider Global South very differently. So I don't really think what China does or what India does is going to influence and impact the total or whole of Global South the way anybody might understand it. But the fact remains that if the world's second largest economy yeah. does or doesn't have a view on a particular issue, it's going to make some impact in some way or other, which could be regional, which could be local, which could be contextual. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I'll give you the last one. I'll, I'll just take uh, one sentence on this. That China might not have come with a public statement, but they have taken very serious steps to reduce the environment uh, polluting uh, routes of manufacturing. They have done away with 100 million tons of uh, induction furnaces. People reskilled and put elsewhere. So their uh, conscious efforts is to bring down their emissions are literally nearer zero, not be zero. So their entire mechanisms of transport, of production mechanisms, they are very fast moving into it. So some study on how China is going about it is very, very important. So they may not be coming with public statement, but you will have a sudden bank 
that that is one country which will have the minimalistic company. Fabulous. Thank you. Claudia, I see your hand up also. If you'd like to talk about that. And there was also one very interesting point that's, uh, that Tuhin had made. Uh, is the G20 where the conversation would move uh, along with the UNFCCC? You can quickly address that and we wrap up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so on, on China, I just want to say a word because, I mean, as I said, I monitor quite closely the submissions at the WTO and China has made quite a lot of submissions to try to bring the issue not only of carbon border adjustments to the WTO and to the multilateral level uh, and to the um, and, uh, the broader issue of trade related climate measures. So this is not to say that China agrees with CBAM, but I think they do recognize the need of having a discussion at the multilateral level, at least according to the submissions. And then about the G20, I think it's it's a good question indeed, because uh, we see that G7, most countries are, are thinking of adopting a carbon price, but now we see at the G20 as well, some other countries considering it. So I do think it could be a good forum because you also, if you look at the global emissions, G20 accounts uh, amount uh, for the, the vast majority of the emissions. So I do see it. Uh, if we could make it there to the G20, then I think then the chances of making it to the multilateral level would be much, uh, much higher. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Today's discussion was extremely enlightening. I learned a lot. Uh, I really, uh, I'm, I'm going back with this uh, important thing that Amitendu said about building trust and the fact that uh, what Sita may raise, what Anandita raised, what uh, Mam has also spoken about, Claudia, the, the need to have a conversation, a wider conversation instead of taking unilateral measures. And most importantly, if this is about climate, then sharing uh, the proceeds to be able to help fellow countries uh, raise their game should not be uh, should uh, should also be part of the discussion uh, with the EU. So on that note, uh, thanks a lot for making the time. I really appreciate it, Amitendu. I know it's really really late for you. Thank you so much for sitting through this, and thank you so much to the audience because what wonderful and interesting incisive questions. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, Anandita Gunjan. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed this. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.